This morning, I have the great privilege and the honor of introducing our speaker for the hour. Our speaker, Dr. Sherwin R. Callwood Sr., was born in St. Thomas, Virgin Islands. At the age of five, he moved to New York. He is the product of true education, Christian education. He attended R.T. Hudson Elementary School and Northeastern Academy. He graduated with the highest Bible award in the history of the school and still holds that record to this day. He received his Bachelor's of Arts degree in theology with a minor in Greek and Hebrew from Oakwood College, now known as Oakwood University. He then matriculated to Christ the King Seminary and Florida Christian University, where he, er where he earned his MA degree in Biblical Studies and his THD degree in theology. While there, he received the President Award for Academic Studies. Pastor Carwood has been pastoring for 30 years in seven districts, which consisted of 21 churches. He also pastored in the Northeastern Conference, the New York Conference, and presently the Southeastern Conference. He has conducted crusades, week of prayers, uh, seminars, workshops in the United States, the Caribbean, South Africa, South America, and Australia. He has also been the youth speaker at various camp meetings. He serves as an adjunct professor at the gradu uh, graduated school of the Northern Caribbean University, where he teaches a course in systematic theology. His ministry has taken him to four continents out of seven. Many of you may not know that he also serves as a chaplain of the Civil Air Patrol. His rank is captain. He teaches moral leadership courses monthly to servicemen. He is also an ACPE Hospital Trauma One chaplain. Currently, Dr. Callwood pastors the Bethel SDA Church, Citra SDA Church, and the Archer SDA Church. Uh, he has two sons, Sherwin R. Callwood Jr., who is a junior this year at Oakwood, studying for the ministry, and Stephen Callwood, who is about to begin his studies in criminal justice. He loves the Lord with all his heart. He loves and enjoys the gift he has been given from God to minister. He loves young people and has a genuine desire to make sure that they make it to heaven. I've known Pastor Callwood for close to 20 years, and I've always considered him to be a mentor in my life. Uh, as I've said many times, it took me three years to be taken on by Southeastern Conference. And when I was waiting for a call, it was Pastor Callwood who would always encourage me uh, to, to stay in there and that uh, God, what God has for me is for me. And so I will always remember that. I'll be uh, forever grateful to him and his ministry, and I want to thank you. So after a next, another selection from our choir, the next voice you will hear is uh, my mentor, my friend, Pastor Sherwin Callwood. Hear ye him.
not been mistreated. Said I shown up been cheated. Said I felt defeated. But I remember. And because of you, I never that did not pass for. I never seen. The righteous forsaken, no receive begging bread. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, my God. 
church say amen. amen I forgot where I was coming to that comes with age and the choir reminded me where I was I told your pastor if you look up and see that the pools are missing it is not that they got raptured yet. They just got transported to Gainesville. Somebody ought to say amen. I got plenty of space in my car. Amen. It is so good to see all of you. And I'm not going to personalize or individualize my greetings this morning. I'm just going to keep it general because if I miss somebody, Sister Jones, they're going to feel slighted. And so I'll save my individualized greetings for after. Is that okay? Amen. Well, it's going to happen anyway, but I just thought I'd ask. But I want to begin by giving God all the praise, the honor, and the glory for my life. And for all that he has done for me. And I was just talking with someone the other day that was beginning their ministry. And I said, I thank God I had a very unique 
ministry. It started off unique, and it's ending up the same way. Amen? And because I'm in my 30th year, and they tell me I can retire anytime I, I get ready. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. I don't plan to work until I can't move. One of my old Bible worker, when I first started some 30 years ago, she's waiting on Jesus to come now. Sister Jelts, and she was 80-something years old. No, she was 70-something. I'm sorry. And we would have staff meetings on Wednesday at the church, and I asked her one day, when are you ever going to retire, Sister Jelts? She looked at me and said, Pastor, where in God's word do you see that they retired? They died on the battlefield, and she died on the battlefield. Amen? I want to thank your pastor, my good friend. They were, let me tell you, when I was in the office, in the conference office, and there were times I've gotten more engagements that I could handle, I will call Pastor Newton. Am I right, Lenny? And every time I called him, he said, I said, don't worry about how, how you're going to get there. I'll get you there. I just need you to go and speak for me. And he always went. And so when he called me, I owed him this one. Amen? I owed him this. So I couldn't tell him no. And I told him I'll be here. And I just want to thank him for those days and watching him grow and become who he is today. I, I thank God for that, for allowing you, allowing God to use you. This is a very long weekend for me, so I'll be here with you today, but then I have to leave to be in Jacksonville for 7, and then I have to be at the hospital for 8.30 in the morning. As he told you, I'm a Trauma 1 hospital. I love it. I'm a Trauma 1 chaplain, and I love every moment of it. I, there's nothing I tell folk I have not seen in that trauma. And boy, I got some stories. Amen, but I won't share them all with you. And so I have to be there tomorrow. And then we started a six-week, one-day-a-week revival in one of the communities, in the community services center there in Jacksonville, I mean in Gainesville. And we're going tomorrow night will be our fifth week there with 40 individuals who are doing Bible study. You ought to say amen. And we, we had five last Sabbath for baptism. And we have 10 more coming up in the next week and a half. And we're looking forward to baptizing the rest and then doing it all over again. We have a total of 80-something Bible studies right now. But we're only handling a little. We're going to handle a little at a time. But God is bringing them in. Amen? And we give him the praise, the honor, and the glory. And then next Sabbath, I'll be back in my district. And then the Sabbath after, I'll be in Orlando. Then the Sabbath after, I'll be at another church and. I, they all called at one time, and I don't know how I got it all in March. And when you text me, you text me at the right moment because I was about to cancel. I said, can we switch the date? But God is good. Amen? Um, um, the boys' family's doing well. The boys, uh, as you know, CJ's at Oakwood, and next year he graduates in ministry. And it's strange now that when I go places, they tell me, your son was here. And so when he tells me where he's going to preach, I, I said, do they mean Sherwin Colwood Sr.? No, Dad, you must decrease so that I must increase. I said, oh, you got jokes now, amen? I said, you got jokes, but I thank God for what God has done for him. He has come a long way. And some of you know his story and what God has done. And, I, and when I see him and, and when he sends me pictures from where he goes and... And one day he sent me a picture, and he was, because, um, you, you know, he, uh, while he's at Oakwood, he's working with Pastor Snell there at his church. And so he sent me a picture, and the picture looked like he was singing. And I said, son, you, do, you don't sing? He said, no, Dad, I was doing tithe and offerings. I said, all of that? <laughs> I said, praise God. I said, I hate to see what happens when you have to sing, Amen. But I thank God for both of them. They're doing well, and keep them in your prayers. Amen? Amen? God has, many times, a strange sense of humor. And in my life, I have seen God's humor. And many times, I tell him, you're the only one laughing. I remembered one day I was, on a Friday, I took my car to go get 
because I'm tired. It's 8 o'clock in the morning. I said get an early start and have the rest of the day free. Everywhere I drove, there was no tires to fit my car. And you would think I had an unusual car. It was just a Honda Accord. And everyone tried and says, no, we don't have it. And finally, around 4 o'clock, hungry and tired, I winded up at a tire place, and they said, we have them. They stripped my car down, and, and sad to say, after they stripped it down, they said, the tire don't fit. I'm mad and hungry, sleepy, and I just want to get out to put my car back together, the wheels back on, let me go. And I was standing by the garage door, and a gentleman drove up in a work truck that had a flat tire. And he stood right in front of me where I was blocking my view and seeing my car get put back together. He turns around, faces me, and says, ain't God good? I said, Lord, not now. <laughs> I'm telling you, just how I went, I said, Lord, this ain't the time. I'm not, I'm not with the program. And so he turned around and he said, ain't God good? And I did like many of us would do. Yeah. He turns back around again. He says, I'm a Christian. What about you? I said, Lord, please. I said, yes, keep him it short. And he said, I'm Baptist. What faith are you? I said, I'm Seventh-day Adventist. He said, for real? He said, man, I got some literature in the mail from you all speaking about some 2,300-day prophecy. Can you explain it to me? I just bit my lip a little bit, and we went from 457 B.C. We dealt with that. We went to the 70 weeks and the three extra years that God gave the Jewish nation. We got all the way up to 1844. God says, I will bring back to your remembrance that which you have studied. And when I left there, I said, Lord, the next time you want me to meet somebody at 4 o'clock, can you not allow me to leave at 8 o'clock? God has a way of bringing something good out of everything. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to our scripture reading. I'm not going to read it all in your hearing. In your hearing. Daniel chapter 3. And let's focus on verse 4. Then Nebuch 24, rather. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound in the midst of the fiery furnace? And they answered and said, unto the king, true O king. And he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. I want us for a few moments to look on the subject. Something good is going to come out of this. Something good is going to come out of this. Pray with me. Father, we've talked. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The first thing I want to do today is to prophesy to you and let you know that something good is going to come out of this. And I know today that some of you are going through the greatest fire of your life. Listen to me, Maranatha. And it's the kind of fire that hurts. And the kind that at times want to make you just cry. And I know it's going to sound crazy, but you ought to be praising God. Hello now. That you made it to the fire. Talk to me. There are people that never made it to the fire. 
And there are people who died at the door of the fire. And let me say this, I, I, I don't, I stop preaching the Bible stories and the parables the way you're normally hearing them. I'm going back through them, Pastor, because God is showing me stuff i never seen before, and I'm preaching them now. Uh, I, I wanted to talk to you today on about the man at the well. I know you heard about the woman at the well. Maybe the next time. But if there was never a man at the well, there would have never been a woman at the well. Talk to me. I know some of the ladies are hating me on that, and I know T.D. Jason and all them preach on the woman at the well, but I want you to know the wom Jesus did not meet the woman at the well. The woman met Jesus at the well, and that's only to show you that when you get to your problems, Jesus is already there waiting for you. Talk to me, but we'll preach that the next time. I looked at the, at, at, at the feeding of the 5,000, and I wondered why is the only one of God's miracles mentioned in all four Gospels? And God showed me something 3 o'clock one morning, Sister Paul. Share that the next time. Come on, say amen. I shared it at Oakwood. I was invited down to Oakwood to do an exegesis on, on, this, on that same passage of Scripture. And when I finished, my Greek teacher, Elder Melanson, was sitting out there. And he came to me afterwards and he said, Sherwin, I've never seen that in that text before. When you can astound, astound your teacher, you got something. And so I knew I found something. I just didn't know what to call it. And he told me the proper name for it. So when I do that, the next time I'll sound educated. Come on and say amen. But here, you ought to thank God that when your problems come, that you did not die at the door of your problems. Follow me. Do you understand exactly what I'm saying? The king's three most mighty men in his army died at the door. It's a miracle that you made it this far. And by all rights, you shouldn't be here. You should have made it or lived through that car wreck. Huh? The officer on the scene said that it's a miracle no one should have come out alive. Somebody else I'm talking to, you shouldn't have lived through that drug overdose. Hmm? You had enough drugs in your system to kill an elephant. You shouldn't have made it. Other people didn't make it, but you are here. I'm talking to somebody right now. It's a miracle that you're not in prison, to tell the truth. You know you're just as guilty even more than the person serving time in jail right now. There's somebody listening to me right now. You know it's a miracle that you're not in some mental institution. Other people have gone through a lot less than you and went through and have lost their minds. And they went off a deep end. What are you trying to tell me, preacher? Well, I'm trying to tell you that you ought to be praising God that you made it to the fire. There are others that died at the door. They died where your miracle began. Come on now. These three mighty men represent the three greatest athletes. The most popular in society. The three most vote, voted mostly likely to succeed. They had everything going for them. And if anybody should have made it, it should have been them. But they died at the door. On the other hand, nobody expected you to make it. Hello. But you're here. Just a few weeks ago, I was down in North Orlando Church. And I was standing up, getting ready to speak. And I looked right down in the third row and saw my fourth grade teacher. Mm-hmm. All my teachers are still kicking. Come on, say amen. Uh-huh. They, they thought well, I wouldn't make it. My eighth grade teacher told me, I don't know what kind of preacher you would ever turn out to be. She would make me sit with her in class, beside her at lunchroom, and, 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 and she would tell me, you're too determined. She was right, but I didn't think she was the one to tell me. And so, so my dad used to call me into his bedroom every morning before I went to school and said, oh, you're going to school, don't let me hear nothing about your mouth coming home. That's why I had to be a preacher. It's the only place I could talk in church and get away with it. You see what I'm saying? I, I can say what I want. Nobody's going to say nothing really till after. And so my dad would call me in and, 
and this particular morning, I said to myself, whatever, if she says that to me today, whatever I get, when I get home, I'm going to have to get it, or she's going to get a piece of my mouth. I was ready. I went to school, and she said, you're too determined. Sitting right there in the cafeteria, I looked at her, and I said, I see, it's been all these years, but I still remember my words. You are determined to have your way with me, and I am determined to have my way with you. You teach me and leave me alone. And I went right back to eating. And I said, I know when I get home, life as I know it is over. And so I was just eating the last supper. My dad is dead in the grave. He did nothing. and He never said anything. So I would assume she never told him. About eight years ago, or maybe 10, I was invited to Maryland to perform the wedding of her oldest daughter. God has a sense of humor, doesn't he? Uh huh. Something good he brings out of it. Because you see, Jesus sees his potential in us. It doesn't matter what others see. What matters is what Jesus sees. I don't care what you think about me. I don't care how you view me. I don't care nothing about that. All I care is what Jesus thinks. Because none of y'all... Thank you. None of you... That sounds better? Whew, thank you, Lord. None of you can save me. But the God I serve, are you listening to me? Nobody expected them to make it. But I uh, expected you either to make it. But here you are, alive, in your right mind, serving God, filled with the Holy Ghost and power. And you want to complain because you're going through the fire. What you ought to be doing is praising God that you make it to the fire and stop complaining. Somebody should say, I, I thank God I made it to the fire. I could have died at the door. I could have died in the car wreck. I could have died of a drug overdose. I could have been serving life in prison. I could have lost my mind. But God had his hand on me. I didn't even know him. He was watching over me. I wasn't serving him, but he was keeping his hands on me. He sent his angels to deliver me. I don't know about you, but I wasn't the, the strongest one. I wasn't the smartest one. I wasn't the most popular one. I wasn't the one expected to make it, but I made it. And there's no other explanation than God. Somebody ought to shout again, thank God I made it to the fire. It is the fire that has brought me to this point in my life, and I give God all the praise, the honor, and the glory. Who would ever thought Pastor Carl would teaching at the seminary? Be real. But I thank God for it. Now you're going to get out the fire. But God just wanted to remind somebody that he was with you before you get out the fire. And he's not going to leave you now. Come on and say amen. As a matter of fact, if you are in the middle of the fiery furnace today, it is positive proof that you're going to come out. Listen to me now. Listen to me. If God brought you, if you're in the middle of the fiery furnace, it is positive proof that God will bring you out of it. Listen to me now. Listen to me. Because the miracle started at the door. Huh? And if God wasn't going to bring you out, you would have died at the door. Come on now. Am I talking to somebody here today? You, would, you wouldn't have made it. And you ought to tell somebody, I'm going to come out. It's a miracle that I made it this far. And God wouldn't have brought me to the middle if he wasn't going to bring me out. I know I'm talking to some people right now that's going through the fire. You're going through it. And I know you f feel the heat. And I didn't come to tell you that the fire isn't real. And I didn't come to tell you that the fire doesn't hurt. 
I know some of you go through the greatest fire of your life. For some of you, it's financial fire. For some of you, it's fire of sickness or the battle of health. For you, it's personal problems for others. So somebody else is going through the fire of dealing with rebellious children. Hold your ground with them. They ask my boys, they, they say, has he always been like that? And mother said, no, only since we had y'all. I don't, they tell you, my dad don't bend. Not when it comes for truth. Are you listening to me? I remember CJ, before he got straight, now he wanted to come in all kind of hours. I said, not in this house. But dad, I said, uh-uh, son. I, I said, even Martin Luther King had a dream. He said, well, 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 the dream did come true. I said, then be like Jesse Jackson, keep hope alive. But it ain't, it ain't happening here. And so one day he came home late, didn't doubt my word, and he came home late and, well, he didn't get home because I called him. I said, wherever you are, make that your home. You ain't coming back up in here. And he made that his home for about three months. And one day I was asked, aren't you gonna go look for him? No. Well, what about the story of the prodigal son? I, I went find my Bible. And I turned to the story. I said, show me in this story where it said the father went looking. I said, when I read it, it says, when he came to himself. That boy hasn't come to himself yet. I said, but you know, I kind of bend the story. I said, every time I go to the, out the house to my car, I look up the street. I don't see him. I get in and go where I got to go. And when I come home in the evening, I just look up the street again. I don't see him. I come on in the house. And one Saturday night, I was coming back from church in Jacksonville, and Dad, I won't come home. Don't put one foot in my house till I get there. So I, around 11 o'clock, the doorbell rang. I opened it. He stood there. I stood here. And he said, Dad, I won't come home. I said, what took you so long? You could have been here a long time ago. I said, but before you step in, I just want you to know something. Nothing in here has changed. So if you can't abide by yourself accordingly, stay where you are. But if you think you can, you're free to come on in. I never had another day of problems out there, boy. You let me? And then when his brother started to lose his everlasting mind, I was sitting downstairs in the, in, in the den, and, and I could hear them all the way upstairs. And CJ up there saying, Steve, this is dad's house and you gotta abide by dad's rules. And when you get your house and dad comes to visit, he got to abide by your rules. I'm down here saying, that's why I ain't coming. <laughs> Are you listening to me? So, 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 so CJ dating this young lady now, and she's saying to me, you got to come on over when we get married. I, I said, wait, 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 wait. I got to come over. I said, I know I ain't moving. Are y'all planning on living in Florida? I said, there's 49 other states. Choose one. And I said, and I'm not coming. Why? I said, don't worry about it. I'm not coming. If she knew what I know, she'll know I ain't coming. Are oh, you listening to me? I'm not going there for them to tell me what to do. They've lost their everlasting mind. I said, fix a carryout. Send it to me. When they get rebellious, you got to hold your ground. You don't do what they do. You bring them to the right way. So when he got to Oakwood, he had to write a paper. He had to write a paper. And he sent me the paper to proofread it for him. And I have it on my laptop still. And I knew it wasn't that he wanted me to proofread it. He just wanted me to read it. And a paper of who impressed his life the most. And he talked about his high school teacher and and uh, there was another teacher individual he talked about, but when he got to the end, he says, the one that has impressed my life the most is my dad. I just stopped and yeah, the tears came down my eyes and all I could do is say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. 
As for me and my house, we're going to serve God. No compromising. Are you listening to me? No compromising. But I came to tell you today that something good is going to come out of this. And I know right now that sounds like insanity because there's no visible, tangible, physical evidence of anything good in the fire. But I came to prophesy to tell you and to declare to you on the authority of God's word. Something good is going to come out of this. Come on, say amen. amen. You are going to make it. And you're not going to get burned up in the fire and come out. And I don't mean you're going to come out crawling on your hands and your knees, beat up, busted, broke, disgusted, no clothes, no money, no peace, no joy, your eyebrows burnt off and smelling like smoke. The devil is a liar. Listen to me. And when, when you come out of this, you're going to come out blessed. You're going to come out healed and delivered. You're going to come out with money. You're going to come out with joy, with peace, with a greater anointing than you ever had before in your life. Something good is going to come out of this. The king chose his three mighty men. In other words, his best, his strongest, his meanest, his best trained soldiers in his army. Somebody says, Pastor, I don't understand. It feels like I'm, I, I'm fighting on a different level. It feels like the enemy is stronger than before and even smarter than before. Well, that ought to tell you something. The devil won't be bringing out his best if you weren't a threat to him. Come on now. The fact that he's bringing out the big dogs. Come on now. Tells me that you must be a threat to him and that you're getting closer to your destiny. Closer to walking in your purpose. Come on now. You're getting ready to step into a greater anointing than you ever had in your life. And he's trying to intimidate you. And get you to back down. Come on now. And the Bible goes on to say, and then they bound them. You see, if he can't intimidate you, he'll try to restrict you. And this is the first thing the devil wants to do is to restrict you, to limit you, to contain you, to take away your liberty, your freedom in God. Come on now. One of Satan's greatest griefs is to see the children of God walking and not walking and living in their liberty. He don't want to see that. He don't want to see them expressing themselves in joy and, and in peace and worshiping and, and praising God without restraint. You see, so that's why he bombards you on Sabbath morning. That's why on Sabbath morning, the things on Friday night that normally don't get on your nerves, get on, on your nerves. So you come to church with your jaws all tight. Mm -hmm. it, it, it has happened all week. But it makes a difference on Friday night and Sabbath morning. And so you can praise God. All the beautiful singing and, and worship that I heard here today. Some of you, some of you were just sitting there like this. Oh, oh I was praising God in my heart. Yeah, but God needs to hear it. You see, you see, you could love me. You could love me all you want in your heart. But, but, but if I don't hear it out your lips, it means nothing. Let, let, let me share something. I can't do a little commercial break? Okay, stop the clock, and then we hit it again, all right? I was talking with my cousin the other day. She teaches at one of our church schools in South Atlantic. And she called me one morning. And she said, Sherwin, I go to church, and I sit there, and I don't say anything. And it dawned on me that God does not hear my praise. And so I told her, I said, our voices, I told her, is just like a signature stamp when you sign. That's why you have voice activated electronics that only picks up your voice once it's tuned into it. I'm, come on now. You see where I'm going? And so when you come to church, and the scripture's being read, and you just sit standing there. Or the hymn is being sung. And your mouth is shut. And everybody else is praising God. God hears everybody's voice, but he misses yours. 
your voice is missing in heaven. Listen to me. Don't say, oh, I can't sing. That's all right. Don't worry if you can't sing. You try to crack a note anyhow because you're doing it for the glory of God. Come on now. And so every time you do it, God is hurt because of everybody else in Maranatha praised me, but you did it. You never cracked your lips to sing praises to my name or give me honor and glory. When, the, when my word was being read, you just sat there. And yet, you want me, God says, to do something for you. Take that home and chew on it. And so the devil sends these things our way to push us down and to back us up and to quiet us down and to put a lid on us and to dampen our praise. But he knows that doesn't work with me. Because the more he sends my way, the more I got to praise him. Because I know that I'm becoming more of a threat to him. Come on now. But God will give his angels charge over me. Come on now. He's going to protect me. He's going to keep me. So that does not make me afraid. It may scare you, but it doesn't scare me. And then the story says, I got to move on. They cast them into the fiery furnace. Not just any fiery furnace, which speaks of adversity and trials and hardships and pain and, and sorrow. But the Bible says seven times hotter, seven times greater, more intense and more painful. Listen to this now. And, and, and I know I'm talking to somebody right now who's fighting something you've never fought before. The attack is more severe. The enemy is more aggressive. The pain is deeper. The night is darker. The weight is heavier. And the hurt lasts longer. But I remind you again, something good is going to come out of this. They fell down bound in the midst of the fiery furnace. I, I, I know we're faith people and we, we don't want to talk negative, but how many... Would just be honest, honest enough to tell the truth and say you've been down one time or two. Come on now, come on, come on, come on. I raise both hands. Come on now. You, you see, because I, I, I've learned in my life it's not how many times I fall down, it's how many times I get up. Oh, 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 are you listening to me? That, that, that's why I don't, so I don't mind raising my hand, telling you I fell down one or two times, but I got up. The fact is sometimes the devil will hit you with something you never expect, and, and it knocks the, the wind out of you, and you find yourself lying on the ground asking yourself, what happened? See, I want us to know there are times, Pastor, that we are no match for the devil. I don't care how holy you think you are. I don't care how righteous you think you are. You are no match for the devil. The devil will put a knot upside your head you will never forget. But I don't have to fear him. I got a savior on my side. Come on now. Huh? I got a savior on my side. But I'm glad that the story doesn't end there. Because it says that the wicked king looked into the fiery furnace and he was astonished. He was amazed. He expected to see three Hebrew boys lying on the ground, turning into crispy critters. But instead he saw four men up, loose, and walking around. Come on and say amen. And the fourth, he says, looked like the Son of God. And he was amazed. I wish somebody would look at the name and tell him, tell him I'm amazing. I'm amazing the devil who thought he had me. I'm amazing the devil who thought because he hurt me and made me cry, it was over. I'm amazing my enemies, the ones who saw me go into the fire and took pleasure in it. The ones who said, I'll never make it. The ones who said, I'll burn up in the fire. The ones who said, drugs will kill me. The ones who said, I'll probably die an alcoholic like my dad or my brother. The ones who said, he'll lose his mind, she'll lose her mind. But I'm still here. Come on now. And you know something? I, 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 I'm amazing myself. Yeah, 
I went through hell, but I'm still here. Come on now. Yeah, the devil hit me hard and I went down and it hurt and I cried for a while, but I'm still here. Come on now. And I have a news flash for the devil. Hey, I'm up again. And I'm on my feet again. And I'm loose now. Come on and say, amen. I got my joy back. I got my peace back. I got my dance. If I knew how to do it, I got that back. And I got my praise back. Are you listening to me? And if the devil thought that I was a problem before, he hasn't seen nothing yet. Because while I was in the fire, I've been working on my praise. I've been working on my shout. As a matter of fact, thank you, Mr. Devil. Because that's where I really learned how to pray. Come on and say amen. That's where I le really learned how to shout. That's where I really learned how to get my praise on, was while I was in the fire. And I'm getting ready to praise like I've never praised before. Because now I know, not only can the God I serve keep me from evil, keep me from the snares and from the traps that the devil set before me, but the God I serve can walk into the, the middle of my fiery trials. Come on now. Right in the middle of my hell and I, that I'm going through. And he can lift me up. He can liberate me. In the middle of my pain, in the middle of my grief, and in the middle of my darkest hour. Oh, can I preach it like I feel it? No God, no God can deliver like this God. Come on now. I'm talking about the God that can shout, shut up the lion's mouth and can take the bite out of them. I'm talking about the God that can breathe through his nostrils and create a super highway through the Red Sea where three million people can walk. Come on now. No other God can deliver like this God. And can I give you some good news? This God is getting ready to show up in the middle of your fire. And this God is getting ready to show the devil who's boss. Let me give you some more good news. The same fire that was intended to burn up the three Hebrew boys burned up the ones who threw them in. Come on now, huh, huh? Burned up the ones who, 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 who threw them in. God said, told me to tell you today, don't worry about those enemies. Come on now. Don't worry about them anymore. Don't worry about those haters and those agitators. Come on now, huh? God says he's going to take care of them for you. Huh? He's saying to you today, like he told Jehoshaphat, stand still and see the salvation of God. You ain't got to do anything. He says, I will revenge you. You did. It's so got to be faithful. Come on and say amen. You don't have to say a word. You're not even going to have to lift a hand. Stand still and see the salvation of God. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. That may not mean anything to some of you. But for those of us who've got some enemies, it means a lot. Come on and say amen. The fire liberated them. The fire burned off the things that had bound them. And I found out that when I got in the fire, there were some things in my life that I didn't need. There were some things that were holding me back, and it took the fire to set me free. The truth is, there was some stuff I didn't want to let go of. And it took the fire to get it out of me. Come on now. I got free in the fire. The fire set me free from pride from self-righteousness. The fire set me free from fear of men. I know we don't want to talk about it much, but there was stuff that did not belong in my life, and it took the fire to deliver me. Is there anybody glad to be free? Huh. Now, I want to say something to those of you who are going through the fire right now. And you know the devil has the thermostat turned up. Hmm? And he has intensified his attack against your life. And you're the one who ought to be shouting and dancing and praising God right now. Because what the devil has done by increasing and intensifying the fire against your life is accelerate your process and your preparation. Some folk didn't get that. Just don't be driving behind them on the way home. You see the car zigzag. They just got it then. Somebody here knows that the devil has turned up the heat 
and the attack on your life, your health, your finances, and your ministry. Your faith has been stressed to the limit. But I came to tell you, what the devil meant for evil, God's going to work for your good. Come on, say amen. And God is going to turn it around. Huh? And God is going to take the very thing that the devil sent to destroy you and incinerate you, and he's going to use it to accelerate you. Are, are you listening to me? Are you listening to me today? Go ahead, devil. Turn up the heat. Heat it up seven times, and I'll come out with a seventh degree blessing. Seven times more joy. Seven times more peace. Seven times more praising and more anointing. Yes, turn it up. Because I'm being accelerated. And you might want to scoot over a little bit because I'm going to go into warp drive. Somebody's being accelerated now, right now. I want you to know it's not punishment. It's preparation. <laughs> Are you listening to me? It is not punishment. It is preparation. I'm talking to somebody right now who feels it, it, to you like you've been in low gear. Like you've been walking on, in quicksand. Like nothing seems to work out. Like you go one step forward and two steps back. Come on now. But I came to tell you, God is getting ready to accelerate you. Something good is going to come out of this. God never said we won't have anything to go through. Isaiah 43 and verse 2 says, When thou passest through the waters, I'll be with thee. And the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither the flame kindle upon thee. You see, kindling is what you use to get a fire, to catch or to hold. Uh, where my path finally Hubby left. Yeah, am I talking? I know he trained you. Am I talking true? Uh-huh. God never said that I want, li listen, listen to me, listen. God never said I wouldn't have to go through the fire, but he said it wouldn't catch me. It would not take hold on me. Come on now. I felt the flames reaching for me, but they couldn't take hold on me. Poverty couldn't hold, couldn't take hold on me. Sickness couldn't take hold on me. Depression couldn't take hold on me. Fear and anxiety couldn't take hold on me. It reached for me. Suicide reached for me. Alcoholism and drug addiction reached for me. Problems reached for me, but it couldn't take hold on me. I'm closing now. But the story ain't over yet. The king looked into the fiery furnace and called them out and publicly declared them to be the winners. <clears throat> the king had to call them out of the fire. I want you in these few moments, listen to what I'm about to say. Because to me, this is the most amazing part of the story. When they did come out, they were up, loose, and walking around. You're asking God, when am I going to come out the fire? Here's the answer. When it doesn't matter anymore. Come on now. When it doesn't matter anymore whether you come out or not, when you've learned how to praise God in the fire and lift him up. When I read the story, the amazing thing to me in this whole story is what, it was that when Jesus showed up, these three Hebrew boys never said to him, um, 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 Jesus, um, now that we're up and loose, can we take this conversation outside the fire? Can we talk on the outside? And I wondered why. And it hit me, dummy. They realized that it was safer in the fire with Jesus than outside without him. Oh, I just 
just come by to tell you, I just come by to tell you, Maranatha, if you're in the fire and Jesus is in the fire with you, you, you are in the safest place you could be. Don't worry about it. Don't lose no sleep about it. He's with you. And when they came out, they were immediately elevated in the kingdom. They were elevated by the fire. I'm trying to tell somebody, something good's going to come out of this. I'm being liberated, accelerated, and elevated by the fire, by the very thing the devil sent to burn me up. It's speeding me up. It's lifting me up. Somebody said, Pastor, I've never experienced this kind of fire before. There's a reason for that. It's because God is getting ready to go where you've never gone before and do what you've never done before. He couldn't lead you where you were because he couldn't use you there. So he had to allow things to happen to get you to where he can use you the best. And so I'll close with this. Something good gonna come out of this two years ago I was doing you can play it, doing my elder a favor in Jacksonville his car broke down so I went home and got my truck and I says I'll tow you back I told your car to my mechanic in Orlando that was gonna do him a good deal and we did it talking about something good is going to come out of this on the way back to take him back to Jacksonville I said let's go the back way save some time I was in a little town called Umatilla and I was doing five miles over the speed limit the officer pulled me over took a long time to write this ticket. And I said, what's taking him so long just to write a ticket? He comes back and he says to me, sir, there's a hit on your license. Turned to my elder, I said, I don't know what he's talking about. Haven't had a ticket in over 10 years. What, what, what is he talking about? He comes back with the ticket and asks me if I could step out the car to sign the ticket. Immediately, I knew something was wrong because they don't ask you to do that. You just tick and you keep going. So I went to the back of his trunk, and as I was signing the ticket, my eyes was glancing on my surroundings. I guess that's the military side of me. His partner had his hand on his gun. And I said to myself, this is not going to be pretty here tonight. When I finished signing, they said, can you place your hands behind your back? There's a warrant for your arrest in Orange County in Orlando. I said, for what? Are you ready for this? Failure to pay child support. I tell you, God's got a sense of humor. But many times, I'm not the one laughing. I said, officer, do you know how old my children are? Who? And he said, are you Sherwin Callwood? Yes. Well, the warrant is on you. I put my hands behind my back, never been arrested a day in my life. They handcuffed me, put me in the back of the car, drove me to Lake County Police Station, did mug shots, put the orange jumper shoot on me, the orange clogs. That's why I don't wear clogs to this day. <laughs> I have a thing against them. And they put me in a holding room cell. And there was some folk that came in with me. They were there. Then they put me in a cell. I was in lockdown. It's Thursday. I had communion rehearsal Friday night. I've got baptism on Sabbath and communion. I'm out of my area code. I can't remember nobody's number. These smartphones ain't that smart because they make you dumb. And I'm trying to remember all kinds of numbers, and I can't remember nobody's number. And my cell phone was in my car on lock. My elder had no access to my phone to know who to call, get numbers, or nothing. 
And I said, Lord, I can't stay here. I got communion and baptism on Sabbath. I got to get to church. I'm laying in that cell and on the wall that there was two guys in the room already in the cell, two beds, so I had to sleep on the floor by a stinking toilet. On the wall was written, someone scratch, keep trusting God. On the other side of the wall was, this too shall pass. I laid in and I said, did my son forget to tell me something? He's got the same name as me. And I was regretting at the moment naming him Sherwin Callwood. And I said, that boy got a baby out there. He didn't tell me, and I'm holding the bag on this thing. The next day I woke up, still in, the, in there. I went to see the judge and they shackled my hands and my feet and I'm walking. You thought I would have murdered somebody. And the judge was on a TV screen. I said, what was I gonna do, jump through the screen and choke her? And the gentleman who went to see in to the screen before me got the judge mad and I said, oh man. So when I got up, she looked at me and said, I don't want to hear nothing from you. You will stay here until Orange County comes and gets you next week. So I made up my mind, I'm spending a week here. I just got my mind set on that and isolated my thoughts around that. My pressure now shot up out of the ceiling. So about four o'clock they came and they bought me some, the nurse, something for my pressure. And one of the gentlemen that came in with me, his name was David. Listen to me now. David said, Pastor, were you able to get anyone? I said, no. He says, I'm going home now. I was just on a 24-hour hold because of my daughter, trying to save my daughter's life. He says, I want you to write on this piece of paper a name and a number. I felt like Joseph in the prison. And when I get out, I'm going to call them for you. I said, praise God. I said, Lord, let me try the pay phone one more time that was there. Still couldn't get a call through. As I hung up the phone, the guard said, Callwood, yes, get your things, you're going home. Just like that. They put me in a holding cell. I never knew I could move so fast in gathering things. They put me in a holding cell with David. David said, Pastor, can you pray for me? The Lord said, tell David I sent you here to save him. Why don't you watch how God works? David and I talked in that cell. We prayed in that cell. David broke down in tears. And I said, God wants you to surrender your life to him. He said, Pastor, you, you've never been locked up before. I said, no. He said, it takes about three hours to process out of here. I knocked on the door. The guard opened the door. I said, how long is it going to take? He said, it's changing of the shift, so it's going to take about two hours. I said, David, I did what God asked me to do. It's not even going to take that long. <laughs> Within 30 minutes, David and I were standing on the outside of that jailhouse waiting on a ride to come get us. I started to say, I'm just telling them, Lord, I don't mean it. I started to say, Lord, the next time you want me to meet somebody in jail, can I be at the back door waiting for them to come out? But I ain't say that because I don't know what God going to do next. You see what I'm saying? So I'm just using that as an example, Lord. We don't mean that. Okay. Monday morning, I called child support. And I told them what happened. The lady said, Mr. Callwood, we have no record of a warrant for your arrest. I says, I don't care what your computer says. I'm telling you what the officer told me and what this piece of paper in my hand is telling me right now. Sir, do you understand the process? No, never had to. You would have missed it for a year. Your license would have been suspended. And notice the officers never said my license was suspended. Your bank accounts would have been frozen. And then the warrant would have been arrested, were done. So then I got nowhere with them, so I called the judge that released me. Her secretary, Tracy, answered. Tracy said to me, I've been doing this for 33 and a half years. 
and I saw your paperwork on my desk. And I said, this man is in jail for something he didn't do. And if he did do it, we never told him. She said, the judge saw it and stamped instant release. And Tracy said, if you're telling me you got out at 5 o'clock and I sent the paperwork over at 4 o'clock, these were her exact words, that was nothing but divine providence because it takes three to four hours to process a person out. God knew I had to get the communion rehearsal. Come on, say amen. And made it to rehearsal on time. A year later, I was taking the eighth grade class on a trip. And I went in Jacksonville, and I went to get money out the ATM, and my ATM account was frozen. Child support enforcement. So I called the courthouse again. They said, Mr. Caldwell, you owe us nothing. I said, but my account is frozen. Could you come down, get a letter from us, take it over to them, and show it to them? I had to go down to the courthouse and pay them $3 to get a letter to clear my name for something I didn't do. I went on the trip and came back, and there was a check in the mail for me for $54 for paying child support too much money. Uh-huh. Don't worry about it. My mama didn't raise a fool. I didn't cast the check. It's still in my briefcase. I left that thing alone. How? I owed you. Now I paid you too much. But the good that, that God brought out of it, something bad, was that David's life needed to be saved. And so while I was in my fire, and I was beginning to complain, why am I here? I didn't do nothing wrong. God was at work trying to save a soul. Are you listening to me? God was at work because God knew that I had to go through what David went through so that David and I can develop a relationship. So that David would be able to listen to me and to talk with me and to pray with me. But if I met him at the back door, David had no time for me. I thank God for that. And some of you are going through something right now. Just listen to the words of this song. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. A wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. Where rivers of pleasure I see, He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love, and he covers me there with his hand. Sing another verse, sing another oh, verse, yes. Oh, he covers me there with his hand. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, he's my Lord. He taketh my burdens all away. He holdeth me up and I never shall be moved. He giveth me strength as my day. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. Yes. That shadows a dry, thirsty land. 
He hideth my life in the depths of His love and covers me there with His hand. And He covers me there with His hand. Listen, listen. My appeals are nothing super fantastic, nothing strange, simple. Somebody needs to be covered by the hand of God today. Somebody needs to be in the cleft of the rock today because you're going through something you've never gone through before. It, it is sapping your, your, not just your physical energy, but your spiritual energy. And there are times at night you ask God, how much more can I take of this? How much longer would this last? You need help today. And for some, you know you've got help. It, it, you just need the assurance that God is with you. Then I'm going to ask you as he sings that last verse. Just make your way down. Let me pray for you. Come on. Come on. Don't, don't wait on nobody. You just come. If you're the only one coming, you just come. Come on. You're in the fire. You need help. You need strength. Come on. Come on. Could you just want to meet him in the clouds when he comes? Perfect salvation. His wonderful love. I'll shout with a million on high. Let's sing that chorus together. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand that's what i like about god you're not alone not only does he holds you in the palm of his protective care he's got you in the palm of one and he's got his hand on top of you and I pray that every morning when you wake up from this moment on, that you do what the Apostle Paul says, put on the whole armor of God, that you will be able to stand against whatever the devil throws your way. This week, uh, not this week, but last week, I was, I was speaking to, to the class on Sunday night that we're doing in Jacksonville about the armor of God last Sunday night. And as I was talking to them about something I noticed about the armor, it only covers our front. God's armor does not cover our back. Our backs are open. And I asked myself the question again, Sister Hawkins, why? Because God's got your back. Come on now. Hey, hey, God's got your back. You ain't got to worry about that because you, you get scared of what you can see in the front. So God says, protect yourself. I want you to see your front. It's protected. And to see what's coming, you ain't got to worry about your back. I've got your back. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'll stick with you even until the end. Hold on, folk. And the servant of the Lord said that when we get to glory, with all that we have gone through on this earth, when we get to glory, we will throw, I thought that we will throw our crowns at his feet when we get into the kingdom. But Ellen White says in the book, Last Day's Event, we will throw our crown at his feet before we get into the kingdom. And we will cry with one voice with all that we have gone through. For truly, heaven is cheap enough. Pray with me. Father, thank you. I've said all that you've sent me here to say. I told them that in their fires, you're there. 
you'll be with them sustaining them and keeping them and empowering them and that when they come out not even the stench of the flame of the fire will be on them I told them that I told them what you said that that not even their clothes or their hair would be burned in the fire and that you would not even use them or allow them to be used as fire starters So keep them in the palm of your protective care. Put your loving arms around each one here that has come and those that wanted to. And Father, do for them what you do for me every day. Give them a big, super divine bear hug right now. And while they're hugging, you're hugging them. Keep reminding them of the promises of your word, of staying by their side, fighting their battles for them, keeping them until their feet shall touch streets of gold and their hands are able to wipe themselves on walls of jasper and their lips are able to wrap itself around fruit from the tree of life, but keep them until their eyes shall behold Jesus for themselves and not another. And may they realize even from now, what a wonderful savior you are. In Jesus name we pray, amen, amen, amen. Turn to somebody and tell them he's wonderful. He's wonderful. Tell them he's sustaining me. He's sustaining me. God bless you. And Covers me there. We definitely want to thank Dr. Carwood for allowing God's Spirit to use him in a mighty way. It was definitely a word for today. Uh, of course, this will not be our last time bringing him here, uh, but we will definitely bring him back before we close off our worship service for today um, I, I do want to make a, another announcement want to remind you uh, that for our AY program this afternoon our health ministry department will start a series on creation health I believe that's at five o'clock five o'clock and so we want to encourage you to come back so that you can receive your blessing. At this time, we are going to ask that you stand for our benediction at this time. Let us look to the Lord. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the word that was given to us today. Father, we are just so thankful for the blessing that you gave us today. Father, help us to remember the words that we heard today. Help us to remember that everything that you allowed in our lives, you've allowed it for our best good, and that something good indeed will come from it. And that any place or any circumstance with you is the safest place to be. Father, we ask you to please be with Elder Colwood in a mighty way. We ask you continue to bless his ministry guide him and keep him in all of his ways him and his family in a special way and father transform us as a result of hearing this word uphold us with the power of your holy spirit this day and through the coming days of this week and we'll be careful to give you the glory the honor and the praise in the name of jesus and for his sake we do pray amen
Hi, I'm Pastor Leonard Newton III, and I just wanted to take a minute and let you know how glad I am that you shared in this hour of worship and Bible teaching with us. We hope that you were touched and truly blessed. This message was brought to you by the support of the Maranatha Seventh-day Adventist Church here in Tallahassee, Florida. We thank God because it's through the support of the congregation, viewers, and listeners like you that we are able to spread this word to the world. We would greatly appreciate your prayers and your support. We want you to know that any and all donations, small or great, are sincerely welcome. To contact us or to give a donation, please visit MaranathaSDA.org. That's MaranathaSDA.org. And if you are ever in the Tallahassee area, come out and worship with us. Thank you. <laughs> 